Okay, the recording has started. So let me quickly introduce our speakers again. Uh, we're welcoming Jeff Squires and Ralph Castain. Um, Jeff Squires is a computer scientist with a PhD from the University of Notre Dame. And he has been working at Cisco since 2006. And he's one of the main developers of the OpenMPI project. Ralph Castain has a PhD in nuclear physics from Purdue University, has been working at Intel since 2013. And he is also the founder and lead developer of the PMIX project. Um, both Ralph and Jeff are um, among the top contributors in the OpenMPI project collectively. So together they have about 30% of all commits in the project, which is quite impressive. And they have quite a bit of pull requests merged as well. So they are very well suited to um, talk about this topic. And with that, I will give uh, Jeff uh, rights to present unless that already works. Yeah, that's already in place. So I think we're good to get started, Jeff. Cool. Thanks, Kenneth. Um, greetings, everybody, uh, whatever time zone you're in. Uh, I'm Jeff. The other floating head on there is Ralph. Say, say hello, Ralph. There hello, he is. Ralph. Um, this is, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> this is part two. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we gave part one. Um, the archived video and the slides are certainly available from that. Um, want to say uh, thank you to Kenneth and the Easy Build community for giving us this invite and this opportunity to present all this information. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in here, and Ralph and I, when we came up with all this content, we kind of took to heart a lot of the questions that we typically got, and that's why we, you know, put into this presentation. And we had so much material that it, we thought it would be one session, and then we're like, well, maybe we should split it into two sessions, and then, yeah, maybe we should probably split it into three sessions. Um, so today's part two of the three, um, and a big thank you to the Easy Build community. A couple of logistics here, real quick. Um, as Kenneth noted, um, this session is being recorded. Um, so if you don't want to be recorded, uh, please leave. The stuff will be available later. Um, there is a Q&A panel for you. Um, we're probably, uh, Kenneth is going to act as uh, marshalling all the questions. Um, some of them he might just answer in the Q&A panel that everybody can see the answer for, or he might uh, either interrupt or uh, ask us at a good breaking point uh, the questions for you. So go ahead and type your questions in that Q&A panel and we'll get to them. So here's our overall overview for the whole thing. Uh, we covered uh, three bits last time in part one. So the background, what exactly is PIMX, and how to build OpenMPI. We're gonna cover a bunch more stuff today. So here's a super quick recap of what we covered. Some terminology that's important here. In OpenMPI, you'll hear us talk about projects, frameworks and components. You'll see that's listed on the left-hand side over there. And that's really just a, a division of how we lay out the code in OpenMPI. Now, this picture here is not a comprehensive list of all of our projects, frameworks, and components, but there's a bunch of the common ones that you'll hear. MPI, Shmem, Opal, PML, BTL, MTL, things like that. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail today, but um, for the MPI types of things, think of framework as a collection of plugins, and component is just a fancy word for plugin. I guess uh, I'll, I'll pick up here. Uh, I covered basically some background on you know what is PMIX. Uh, it, uh, as I said back then, it uh, it derived out of the old PMI one and two things that came out of MPish really was focusing more on the exascale kind of systems and then on workflow orchestration. Um, started in late 2014. As of today, it obviously has grown quite a bit and uh, is now supported by a wide range of libraries and tools and pretty much ever all the RM vendors out there. Jeff? And, you know, and, and its role really is to act as the go between between the application process and the resource manager, uh, basically passing requests up to the resource manager and then the responses back for various things. And we're going to go into a little more depth today about exactly what is that role and what kind of requests are going back and forth between them. 
Okay. And then in the last part of uh, part one there, we talked about how to build open MPI. And this is the super short version um, that you just download the tarball, you untar it, you go into the directory and you run configure, make, make, install. And there is a little bit of magic in there um, that you can specify a bunch of uh, parameters on the configure command line. Most of them typically have to do with which network communication stack you want to use, but there's a variety of other things as well. Uh, go back and have a look at the slides in the video and we talk about all of these things and, and PMIX in, in more detail here. Um, so that's the super kit recap. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to stop presenting and Ralph is going to take over. Um, Kenneth, I think you have to give uh, presenting um, permissions to Ralph and he'll take over for the first part here. Hang on a second here. I just had accidentally got off that page. You should have presenting rights now, Ralph. Uh, I don't, oh, there we go. There we are. Okay, good. Let's do the, uh, let me do the screen. So, okay. Sorry, logistics always get in the way no matter how hard you practice it in advance. Um, so let's talk some more about PMIX. We're going to get to PERTE, I think, in, in the third session and exactly how that ties into OpenMPI. But let's, let's uh, focus a little more on, on PMIX because especially when you get to OMPI uh, version 5, which is coming out later this uh, fall, hopefully, um, you're going to find that PMIX is going to play a pretty major role in it. It already is uh, kind of the backbone of it at the moment, but it's going to become even more prominent in its role in, in version 5. So um, where is it used? Well, it's, it's actually grown quite a bit. When we originally wrote it, uh, you know, like late 2014, early 2015, OpenMPI was pretty much the only user of it. Um, and uh, and with the, we did one resource manager at that time, which was Slurm. Uh, things obviously have grown quite a bit. Uh, so you can see here a list of all the various libraries. You pretty much all the MPIs and all the OpenShmem libraries now support it. And there's some support now in PGAS as well. Uh, from the resource manager side, as I said uh, in the last session, pretty much everybody uh, is now supporting it. I, I, I'm not entirely sure of the status of Univa Grid Engine. Uh, I haven't talked to those guys in a while, but but everybody has pretty much picked it up. And you can see that the the, uh, the upcoming Cray uh, Shasta environment, uh, their launcher is called PALS, uh, that uh, is now supporting it. and um, and we're actually working right now on Kubernetes support, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But in addition to the just the adoption rate, we're, we are seeing a lot of new use cases show up. Um, the debugger guys have already uh, got their products integrated with it and uh, are now ready to release. Um, but we're seeing things like Spark and TensorFlow picking it up and using it because it allows them to do some things in terms of marshalling uh, processes together for collective operations on the fly. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff in, in the MPI world where people are doing some advanced MPI related things. And then there's uh, the ability to log information. So uh, this isn't so much, um, you know, like a, an application writing uh, data out. It's more a thing of being able, for example, for an application to to log into the job record of, of the resource managers maintaining that, you know, I got this far in my, in my application at this point in time, just for help in terms of debugging things if things go wrong. So there, there's the ability to do some logging that's kind of intriguing to people. And then uh, I'll talk more about the container support, but pretty much all the containers now uh, do have some level of support for, for PMIX. So uh, last time I mentioned that, you know, we started off looking at the scalable launch issue um, and there were a number of things we did to try and, and, and make launches scale better. But once you had that in place, then it, it really became intriguing to look at well, what else can we do with this? Because we created it as kind of a generic application to resource manager inter interaction mechanism. And, 
as you can well imagine, as soon as you opened that up and said, well, we're going to use that, you know, to make things go faster at launch, people said, well, I think I could use that for something else as well. Uh, so once the connection was made, people started looking at, well, we'd like the ability for an application, for example, to generate an asynchronous event uh, and be able to direct where it goes to. So I want to notify the other processes in my job that that I'm ready to checkpoint or, I, you know, something has happened and you, you all need to take some kind of action. We also want the ability to be pass events in. So if the system sees a node going down or that a node is overheating and, and is going to need to be taken down, that the system can actually, uh, you know, generate an asynchronous event to the applications and let them deal with it, decide what they want to do. So once we had an event notification working, then people came to us and said, well, we we're running hybrid applications where we have like OpenMP and MPI both active in the in a process. And we have problems where we don't have a way for the two to know that the other guy is there and they are competing for resources within the process. So they actually took the event notification system and decided to, to use it a little differently than we had originally thought of. And they now use it actually within a process for the different models to be able to e alert each other to when uh, to a that they're present, but also to be able to say like I'm going to need all the I'm going to go into a compute intensive section of the app of, of this process. I need you to stop communicating for a while uh, so that I can have all the cores for myself. Um, we also then started talking with the tools folks because uh, they have had the problem that, you know, if I write a tool, for example, that works with MPI for debugging purposes, um, I wasn't, they weren't able to use it for any other programming model without completely rewriting its mechanisms for interacting with that model. Um, and that meant it was very difficult for them to try and expand their, their, their use, their uh, usage model. So like, you know, if you were talking, for example, about um, I have a data analytics tool, let's say it's Spark or it's uh, Hadoop or whatever it is. Well, the parallel debugging tools that were available for MPI would actually be rather useful in that case, but you couldn't use them because they didn't know how to talk to your job. So what we did is we went ahead and worked with them and defined a, a completely generic uh, connection and interaction system for for tools to work with different job, uh, different programming models, different launchers, different environments, um, all based on a set of abstracted uh, interfaces, so that they can now take the, a tool that that talks to an MPI job, for example, and use it pretty much anywhere for Shmem jobs, for uh, Hadoop jobs, or Spark jobs, or even for TensorFlow jobs. Um, and actually be able to step through, for example, uh, the way you would with a parallel debugger today. So then we said, okay, well, other people came and said, well, we have other ideas of things we could do for it with it. So they started looking at, for example, being able to change allocations. I mean, if I can interact with the resource manager, resource manager can connect to the scheduler and pass that request along. Well, I'd like to be able to dynamically add or remove uh, nodes out of my allocation. Um, and, and that has some, some obvious impacts on, on different uh, programming models. So we added the ability to do that. While we were doing that, the concept of actually being able to loan a node uh, came up. And so we provided the ability, for example, for a, an application to say, I'm not gonna need these nodes for the next 10, 20 minutes or whatever. Uh, I'm going to loan them back to the resource manager, to the scheduler, but the loan carries a caveat that when I need it, I can um, I can get it back on a, on a preemptive basis. Uh, so the cloud folks have started to find that of use. Um, and hand in hand with that, they then wanted the ability for an application to say, I'm willing to be preempted. So you might get a little bit better uh, charge rate, for example, if you make your can your application a candidate for preemption. And then we define a handshake so that when the resource manager wants to preempt you, it, you know, it can let you know, I'm going to, I need to preempt you. You have a chance to actually do something like checkpoint your application or whatever, let the resource manager know you're ready to be preempted and then be preempted at that point in time. 
So there's a bunch of stuff in there that's not just allocating nodes, but how one goes about managing the allocation and, and deallocation, if you will, of nodes that all got put into that area. Another group came along and said, hey, we want to be able to dynamically assemble groups. So if you want to think of it from an MPI standpoint, you know, want to be able to dynamically create a communicator and then dynamically tear it apart when you're done. Rather than starting it, uh, you know, creating it at the beginning of time, and then when you tear it apart, you have to actually kill the whole application. This was of interest to people like the data analytics groups and stuff, where there are periods of time in the computation where you actually want to use something like MPI, but you don't want the whole job to be an MPI job because processes may be coming and going and stuff, and MPI doesn't handle that very well. So, uh, so we created a, a, a groups capability that allows you to asynchronously assemble and destruct uh, process groups. Uh, the storage folks came and talked to us about, well, what about being able to, you know, to indicate that you want to pre-cache files or that you want to asynchronously move storage around. Uh, say I, I, I have a data analytics job and I know that I'm going to need a particular data set uh, coming up in the next, you know, when I finish this particular calculation, I want to be able to tell the storage system, hey, get it out of deep storage and bring it up to the surface or cache it into a local data store so that when I do need it, I can get at it quickly. Or I may want to specify a storage strategy like, hey, this is data. I really need to make sure this data is safe. I want you to stripe it uh, across, across in a certain striping pattern across your storage systems. So we've just started this one. We're adding the ability for right now to query what's available from the storage system in terms of size, uh, you know, capacities, bandwidths, uh, what's been allocated to you, what's the total system look like and stuff. And then we're moving, we have a working group that's starting to work on, on specifying some of these other um, APIs and directives. And finally, we were asked to start looking at power management, uh, mostly from a strategy standpoint of um, both the the application being able to request a change in strategy. I, I need to go into a more power intensive uh, section of the code or uh, of the operation, et cetera. So I need you to change the strategy that you're using. And also from a resource manager standpoint, because there are multiple power management uh, uh, libraries out there, providing them with an abstraction layer that where they can say, hey, I, I, want, I need to set this power management strategy and, uh, and they don't want to have to write, you know, five different sets of code to do that because there's five different libraries out there that somebody might want to use. So as you can see, it, it has broadened a great deal over time. But the interaction architecture remains the same. We don't want the application directly doing any of these things. We're trying to keep the application as more the orchestrator in charge of these things in terms of making the requests and knowing what it wants to have done. But we'd rather not have the application making the connection directly, say, to the fabric manager or to the storage system. Because it winds up, if you know, if you have a million processes and a million procs are connecting to those sub subsystems, it's just overwhelming. You can't do it at any, at any kind of scale. So instead, we maintain this abstraction that PMIX as a client serves the application. There may be multiple app, uh, programming models inside that application that are coordinating through that PMIX client. But the client remains the sole connection up to the server which is typically hosted in the RM uh, daemon. And all orchestration requests go to that server and all responses come back from that server. And then the resource manager can use the PMIX APIs itself as a, an abstraction to talk to each of these subsystems rather than having to write their own codes to support five or six different storage systems, file systems up here, um, they can call the PMIX APIs and PMIX has the plugins that are specific to each of these file systems to execute that operation. And then, like I said, the tool support connects into the server to allow tools to interact um, through the PMIX into the application or even into the rest of the system management stack, again, through those abstractions. So if you look at that, the role of the, um, of the PMIX sitting inside this application, it looks a heck of a lot like a container. 
And this is what the container people latched on to is they said, hey, wait a minute, you know, if this really became a container, then maybe PMIX becomes the abstraction by which we can interact with the outside world. And where that gets really interesting is when you want to be able to port your, your containers. Uh, central to doing that is that you have to be able to ensure, if I go back and look at that again for a second, you have to ensure that this standardized interface here from inside the container to outside the container can, can, can operate across different versions because the PMIX that's outside here may be changing as versions go through, but the PMIX inside the container will be static. And so you're going to have this cross version situation becoming more the norm than the, than the unusual situation. So what PMIX has got is a is basically is made a pledge to maintain cross version compatibility. Uh, when a client connects to its local server, there's a handshake that occurs that allows the two of them to select the most the highest, most common messaging protocol as the versions change. So if the client is at a higher version than the server, the client will pick the lower messaging protocol that the server supports. If the reverse is true, then the server will pick the, the lowest, the highest, uh, I should say, messaging protocol that the client supports. And the two of them agree on what that is gonna be. We didn't have that early on. So uh, you can see that some of our earliest releases don't support that. But by the time you get to version 2.1.1 and above, and we're about to release version four, Basically, they are completely interchangeable between the client and the server. It doesn't matter which one is higher or lower. They will uh, negotiate properly. They will select the proper uh, protocols to work. So what that then did was it said, okay, for the container guys, what we're going to do is rather than them having to put, you know, some kind of, a, of, of, a, of an agent in between, to even things out, because you know this this external entity might not even have a PIMIX server in it. So you want to be able to keep the container as standardized as possible, so the application doesn't wind up having to you know say, well, if PIMIX is available, do this; if PIMIX is not available, do that. So we introduced this concept of an Epix uh, daemon that's inside the container, and that basically serves as a as a um, a leveling agent. So if the PIMIX client sees a PIMIX server outside that does everything it wants, this Epix daemon basically just does nothing. It just relays things back and forth. If it turns out there's nothing out here in terms of PIMIX services, then the Epix server becomes a full server and it does everything it can to support that, 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 uh, that client, including talking to the to the various system management stack uh, elements that are out there. So this basically becomes just a leveling agent inside the container. And so why do all that? It's strictly for portability. And this is something that you'll see talked a lot about a lot in the, in the PIMIX community. We want the ability to be able to take a container or an application, it doesn't have to be in a container. I wanna be able to run that on something like Kubernetes, and I want to be able to take that exact same thing and run it on an HPC system under Slurm or PBS or Shasta if it's Cray or Flux or whatever it is. And I want to do the same the other way around. I don't want to have to make any changes in order to be able to execute it. And that's what we're working towards uh, with PMIX. So um, if we put all that together and we talk about, well, how do you launch a, a gigantic job? I'm not going to walk you through this in detail because it takes too long. Um, I have done this uh, in other uh, presentations. And if people want me to, I'd be happy to you know, have a dedicated you know, half hour to 45 minute presentation that we can tape that walks you through every step of this. But it's an orchestrated launch. In other words, Every step of the way, the resource manager and the and the scheduler, the workload manager, are working hand in hand with the with the various system management components to to pre
prepare each stage for the next stage so that there's minimum time lost in terms of, of having to you know do something where I could have done it in parallel before. Everything is happening in an orchestrated fashion. From beginning of time when I start to uh, actually uh, incorporate how long it's going to take me to get my files, for example, into the scheduling system. So I don't I don't schedule your job, you know, 10 minutes before the files can get there if it's coming from cold storage, but we actually know when the data is going to get there. To caching your files in your library somewhere network near the nodes that are going to be allocated so that they're ready to go as soon as the allocation starts. To being able to for, to give you all the information required for a job to actually operate, communicate everything at the time this process even starts. So there's no wire up uh, protocol, no all gather exchange of endpoints or anything like that. Every piece of information that job needs in order to execute is given to it at time zero when it starts to execute. So that that's a pretty complex um, orchestration. Uh, PMIX doesn't actually do the orchestration, it enables the orchestration. And we've been working with the resource manager and scheduler communities to build each of these stages into their code using PMIX as the glue for making that those communications occur. And most of them are pretty much through stages two through four at this stage. Uh, stage one, we're working with them on uh, because it's a little trickier where you're trying to figure out what files and libraries a given application depends on without necessarily having the user have to tell you everything. Um, so we have to get some things from them, but we're trying to, to make it as automated as possible. We also, again, support the tools. I'm not gonna go through this in, in too much depth here, but, but just the tools basically all work off of uh, a set of rendezvous files that are put out by the server telling you how to connect to the server. So you can tell the tool, here's the URI for that particular server, go connect to it, and that's fine. But a lot of times you don't really know the URI of the tool itself. So what you wanna do is you wanna have some kind of mechanism for discovering how to connect to it. And what we've done is we've created a set of rendezvous files that contain that information. And the reason there are several of them here is because you might want to, you might know the namespace of this tool, the job ID of this tool, but nothing else about it. Or you might know the PID of the tool that you want to, or the server, excuse me, that you want to connect to, but you don't know anything more about it. Or you may know nothing about it, and so you need to just do a generic search. So there's a set of, and you'll see this when you do these, when you do the installations, uh, there's a set of rendezvous files that get created every time one of these servers starts up just to allow it uh, to um, for a tool to be able to go and search these guys and find how to connect to that server. So here's a, a list of some of the current support we have. Um, there's all the usual startup stuff, you know, you can put data, get data, uh, you can execute barriers, you can spawn processes, uh, you can you can uh, group things with connect and disconnect, and you can publish data to a kind of central uh, key value store and, and then look it up. So this is all the kind of stuff that you typically saw from like a PMI one or two. But then there's all the tool connection stuff that allow you to, for example, just generalized queries about the system. Um, you can forward standard I/O for the tools. PMIX will do that for a tool, so you don't have to write all that code yourself. Um, and then there's things like generalized query support. So you can find out like what the status of your job is. How did it get laid out? Uh, how much, you know, what's the status of your of the, of the scheduling queues? Uh, all that kind of stuff is available. I talked about the event notification system. All that's in there. Uh, there's a logging capability I mentioned where you can put status reports or error output into things like syslog or, or drop them into um, uh, your job record uh, from the resource manager. And then the allocation stuff is all in there to be able to request and, and, and release resources and do preemption notification and stuff like that. We also have uh, some stuff that's just been added for network support. So you can get, uh, you can ask for security keys, credentials of various types. Um, you can ask to, we can uh, set up the local drivers. This is more for the for the launch capability. 
but you can also uh, query things like what's the state of the fabric? Uh, how, how congested is it? Can I get a traffic report showing me where the congestion areas are? Um, you know, what's the capabilities? Uh, that kind of stuff. All that is now being supported. I talked about cross version support that's there and the container support that 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 that, that creates. There's also a set of job controls uh, features in there. So you can actually ask that uh, individual processes or in, an entire job be paused or killed or, or or hit it with a signal of some kind. Uh, you can ask that your, your processes uh, be monitored for heartbeats. Uh, and then there's, uh, you know, checkpoint restart coordination where you can ask the, you can actually provide a job control signal saying, uh, asking the resource manager to, to uh, checkpoint your job, or at least tell your job to checkpoint. And then, like I mentioned before, we had this asynchronous ability to roll up and tear down process groups. Programming model support. Um, PEMIX has the ability to automatically forward um, uh, NVARs. Uh, you, so we um, we have plugins for each of the of the major uh, programming models. So for OpenMPI, uh, we will look for specific OpenMPI uh, uh, syntax on par, on uh, environmental parameters. Those get picked up and forwarded for you. Um, we also uh, set up the MPI three. Um, uh, uh, NVARs that are required uh, by the MPI forum uh, and then a bunch of other things. Basically, we tailor the environment to that particular programming model. So uh, whatever it is that programming model uh, expects to see in the environment uh, or in, and also what environmental variables it might have, we try and do that for, for the, uh, the resource manager. The same thing for OpenSchmem. Uh, we have one for that. And then uh, we also have this uh, hybrid programming model support that I just discussed before. So the architecture, getting into the <clears throat> brass tacks of Open PIMX, um, it's an MCA component architecture. It looks just like what you saw, what Jeff described for Open MPI. We borrowed it from them. It's the same build system, so it's all uh, auto tools built. The, probably the biggest di difference between us and OpenMPI is that we do not have any embedded libraries in the system. Um, we chose not to do that. So uh, you have to provide an external version of either libevent or libev. We support both of those and hwloc. We also have um, optional support. Uh, some of the features, for example, if you want to get access to uh, Cray's Slingshot Fabric Manager, then we need curl and lib Jansen uh, to be in there. So there are some optional dependencies for some of the features. We also do have Python bindings on PMIX, uh, but you need Cython in order to enable those uh, because we use that to build them. And then if you want us to support the Lustre file system, when we do those storage, have all that storage query capability and everything, then we need access to the Lustre client. Uh, and we do use uh, libz. Uh, and we do try to auto detect that if it's available, we use it for compression purposes on some of these data areas, because you can imagine well, we've got this much data flowing around. Um, it can be a little bit big. I've listed here a couple of the key uh, frameworks. The PTL is, is basically you know, the PMIX transport layer, if you will. It, uh, it actually it mostly you use TCP today. We have a USOC one, a, a Unix uh, socket. Uh, one that we used uh, for local communications. We've deprecated that, but it's still there uh, to support people who, you know, have containers that that have, that use that uh, component. Um, and then I told you, like I said, the rendezvous files. And then the other one that you really want to look out for is the GDS, the Global um, uh, gener sorry, Generalized Data Store. Um, there are three components in there in particular, the hash component that's always on, and then there's a shared memory component. There's two variants of it, uh, DS12 and DS21, uh, that are that are present. So it's worth uh, keeping an eye on those two in particular. And I give you the uh, the URI there for for a list of instructions on how you get the implementation and how to build it. So some build tips. Um, if you want to build the ex external external PIMX to use with OpenMPI. 
uh, one of the real things you got to watch out for is that you have to use this an external lib event HWLOC then for open MPI. Uh, the reason is because you have to use the exact same libraries for PIMIX as you used to build open MPI. Otherwise, PIMIX, depending upon these two uh, libraries, you'll get library con and symbol confusion between them. If you don't, if you don't keep that combination constant. So if you're going to use external PIMX, you got to use external lib event and external HWLOC. You need to make sure that all three of those uh, match each other. Um, if you're going to do a direct link for for applications, so applications are going to link directly against PIMX. You can call PIMX directly from an application. That's normally how it's used. Um, it is reference counted, so if 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 OpenMPI is using is involved in that application, OpenMPI is going to call PIMX in it. If the application calls PIMX in it, that's fine. It, it would no harm done. You just need to balance have the same balance for PIMX finalized to clean up. Um, if you're using OpenMPI, uh, if it's in, if it's the embedded PIMX. Starting in version 5, those symbols are exposed, so you don't need to do anything else if you want to use PIMX from inside an OpenMPI application starting with version 5. If it's version 4 or below, you're going to have to use the external PIMX in order to avoid confusion. And that means, again, you got to use the external lib event in HWLOC. Uh, either way, the OpenMPI wrapper compiler knows how to do the right thing and make sure you hook to the right place. If it's a non-open MPI app, we do provide a PIMX CC wrapper compiler just, just to make sure you get hooked to the right PIMX uh, installation and the corresponding lib event in HWLOC. Uh, there are a set of tools that come with PIMX. There's a P adders tool that reports what are the attributes that we support for that particular implementation. Uh, there are three levels. You can look at the client, the server, and the host environment. And it tells you not only what the attribute is, but a description of what, what actually that attribute does. You can uh, use a tool to inject a PMIX event into the system. So if you, you want to be able to tell your, your application, hey, I'm hitting you with a SIG, a SIG user 2, for example, P event will do that using a, um, uh, a PMIX event. So you can generate events uh, on the fly. There's also a lookup capability. So if you want to look at what's going on inside the general generalized data store, you can do that. Uh, PMIX info is just like MPI or OMP info uh, out of, for, for uh, open MPI. It tells you all the build information. There's a PPS that will go ahead and contact the local system uh, and use PIMIX to query what are all the jobs running and what their status is. A P query tool that lets you just you know put on there, hey, uh, here's an attribute I want to query about, and uh, and it will go and do it. So you can think like, you know, I want to know what the storage capacity is on this system, or what the fabric uh, situation is in terms of you know how busy is it, etc. P query will let you do that, and then like I said, there's this wrapper compiler. So there are a couple of conflicts you need to watch out for when you install this. So Slurm and Cray both have PMI1 and PMI2 libraries of their own. And those libraries are completely incompatible with PMIX. Okay, they have their own communication protocols. In fact, those libraries are incompatible across the two environments. So you can't take a Slurm PMI1 library and use it on Cray. It won't work. Um, so uh, the problem is that PMIX has a backward compatibility libraries for both PMI1 and PMI2. So in other words, if somebody is making PMI1 calls in their application or in their programming library, and they don't want to change that to use PMIX calls, they can still link against the, lib, the PMIX library, and we will take their calls into PMI1 or PMI2, and our library will translate that into the, the corresponding PMIX call and then execute it. The difficulty is that if you install our backward libraries for PMI 1 and 2 into a default location, you can overwrite the PMI 1 and PMI 2 libraries that Slurm and Cray installed. And then you'll have broken anybody who's trying to use those libraries to interact with the, you know, with the, with the resource manager. So what we recommend to avoid that is 
just to you know use the DS disable PMI backward compatibility uh, option on the PIMX con configure line, and then we won't make our own PMI one and two libraries. Um, it means that you know it, it, you won't be people won't be able to link against PMIX and you call PMI one or two and have it work. But if they, if you've installed PMI one and two for Slurm or Cray, you probably don't want them doing that anyway. Um, and so we're probably going to make this a default because we've we've seen usage of those backward compatibility libraries kind of die off as everybody's converted over to PMIX. Um, but just as a heads up, until it becomes the default, if you're going to install on these environments, you probably want to turn those libraries off. And I'm going to stop there. Uh, Kenneth, I don't know if there are any questions for me. Um, yeah, we have a couple of questions. Um, let me scroll back and find them. The first one is related to the ASIC and cross model um, notifications that PMIX has. Uh -huh. The question is if there are any examples of uh, open source applications using that, the async and cross model stuff. Um, there are. Uh, there's a couple of research papers that were published on it as well. Um, why don't I uh, pass that to Kenneth after the meeting and then he can maybe include it in the minutes or something like that. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. Um, another question is you mentioned that PMIX has integration with Luster. Does it also have integration with GPFS or BGFS or other file systems maybe? Not currently. Um, we are working with those teams to try and get them to do that. Um, we just haven't gotten them to, to take the time to do that. Uh, okay. Best thing to do is if you're interested in that is to poke your, your vendor and ask them to please step up and do that. Okay, that's a good suggestion. And then in terms of the libevent and hwlock library, so you mentioned they have to be in sync between OpenAPI and PMIX, so you don't get any nasty linking issues. But is that the same um, when, is that the same for Slurm? So do you have to link both Slurm and PMIX to the same libevent and hwlock? No, you don't. And the, and the reason is because uh, your application is not going to um, link against Slurm. So uh, the interaction between the resource manager and your application is strictly through the, the uh, PMIX communication protocols, not through any kind of interlibrary uh, uh, function calls. So, uh, so the version of PMIX that you're using in your application doesn't have to be the same version that you're using in Slurm at all. In fact, usually they're not. Um, you just need to be able to, to handle it for the cross version capability needs to support whatever combination you have. So as long as you're above 211 on, on both sides, it doesn't matter what the other side is. We'll just negotiate the proper thing. Ralph, let yeah. me throw in a little extra color here too. The, the issue really is, is the interaction of these libraries inside of a single process, right? So we're usually talking about the MPI process here. And the MPI process interacts with uh, potentially libpimix, hwloc, libevent, MPI, and therefore you need to completely disambiguate exactly which instance of the library is talking about. If you accidentally, and this can actually happen Sometimes it's useful, but almost always it, it's more confusing than useful. You could actually accidentally end up with two different copies of HWLOC inside the same process, or two different copies of libevent inside the same Linux process. And that's where the types of problems occur that Ralph is trying to warn away from. Like, oh, if you're doing external PIMIX, then do external everything from OpenMPI. So, don't use the embedded HWO. Don't use the lib embedded libevent. Don't use the embedded PIMIX. Have external versions of all of those, and both PIMIX and OpenMPI refer to all those external ones, and then you're guaranteed. Nope, there's there's only one HWO in my MPI process, or one libevent in my MPI process. And I realize this is kind of abstract and and confusing, but that is just the crazy world that we live in, and our computing systems are a bit complex. So this point was very definitely worth bringing out because we've seen 
uh, users get confused about this exact point. And and uh, just to be to be uh, clear, uh, Open MPI's configure system checks for this. Okay, we've had enough problems with this. We check if you specify yeah. an external uh, PIMX and you have not specified an external lib event in HWLOC, we will error out and tell you you can't do that. Okay, so uh, so we try and protect you, but we want to make sure people are aware. Now, now we error out. Now you know, we are we out. We didn't use YouTube. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, enough people ran into this problem. We're like, you know what? We're just going to make configure fail, uh, so that you don't get confusing weird seg faults when you run your applications later. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I've seen that pop up. It works well. Um, one more question, maybe, um, for turning off the compatibility with PMI one and PMI two. Should we do that so we can use both Intel MPI and Open MPI? Uh, uh, yeah, you probably want to in, in, at this point in time. Intel MPI is, has, has now done uh, their PMIX integration, so going forward, you won't necessarily need to do that. But um, but you know, we're, it's not in, in widespread use, so your distribution probably doesn't have that capability at the moment. But uh, I think you know, a year from now, that's probably not going to be the case, and you won't have to do that. But it's probably today, you're probably safer doing that, just disabling that, that backward compatibility. Okay, that's all we have for questions for Ralph. So let me pass presenter role to Jeff. Yeah, so we're in a kind of an awkward position here. We're at uh, 10 minutes before the hour and I have a bunch of slides to do. What do you want to do here, Kenneth? Do we continue on to my part? Um, I think it makes sense to continue, yes. Um, okay. And just we'll see how I think most people have planned for an hour and a half. So even we should still have some time for questions. If that works for you. Cool. Well, now we get past all this boring PIMIC stuff and we get into the real good stuff, the MPI stuff. And Ralph's probably on mute, but he's swearing at me right now. This is what happens when you work with somebody for... 15 years. Um, okay, so in um, in MPI, Open MPI 4, we have all these frameworks, right? I'm not going to talk about Open MPI version 3.x. Let's talk about current generation. Um, 4.0.x is the current generation, the current version of Open MPI that's out there. We literally just released a 4.1.0 release candidate yesterday. And I would say it's an early release candidate. There's still some things that aren't even in there yet, but we needed to do some infrastructure things. But anyway, 4.0.x and 4.1.x is what we're talking about here. So I just generalized that all together and called it 4.x. These are the frameworks uh, that are in the MPI layer, uh, with the exception of DTL, which is technically in a different layer, but we always talk about it in the context of MPI. So I, I lumped it here as well. Um, all of these actually do have meanings. Um, I'm not going to read all these out. You can read them all out yourself, and they'll be in the slides later, too. Um, but some of these are more popular and more meaningful than others. Some of these are just behind-the-scenes things that, you know, users and system administrators never see. In particular, these are the ones that people typically care about. The other ones are important, too, in their own way. Um, and there certainly are cases where it matters to people. But these are... These are the big ones that people usually talk about. So let's let's go into a little detail about them. So this one is a little less popular, but we do get this question uh, at least once or twice a month. Um, I/O is the top-level MPI file operations, right? So MPI APIs such as file open, file read, file write, and so on. For many years, there was a reference implementation out of Argonne National Labs and MPitch called Romeo. Um, and they implemented all the MPI IO APIs. And so in OpenMPI, we just had a Romeo component and we just dispatched off to Romeo for them to do all the, the work. Uh, several years ago, I wish I could remember exactly which year it was, um, we came up with our own called Umpio. So OpenMPI IO, and that was primarily work done at the University of Houston with Dr. Edgar Gabriel and his group down there. Um, so, UMPIO is actually the default these days in almost all situations. 
Umpio is still continually being developed and improved, and they do good stuff down there. This is part of the, the fantastic part of being an open source community. Um, I believe that uh, Luster support is among the last stuff that they're finally picking up. I, oh, I don't remember offhand if that's going to be in, in 4.1 or if the Luster support is coming in 5.0. I'm sorry, I just don't remember that offhand. But in most cases, Umpio will just self-select itself um, if, if it can do, you know, work on your uh, file system and environment. Um, otherwise, it'll just transparently fall back to Romeo. So, for example, in a Luster environment today, if you do NPI file open and whatnot, it'll just automatically select Romeo for you. Um, the next one is call, and that is for MPI collective operations, like broadcast, barrier, reduce, et cetera, scatter, gather, all the rest. Um, it's a really complicated decision as to which collective algorithm is used. There are, so MPI collectives, and in general, collective operate, network collective operations, have been an active area of research for two decades, if not longer. Um, and so there are a number of well-known network algorithms that are you know the way to do things right so like what's the right way to do a broadcast what's the right way to do a barrier what's the right way to do a reduce well picking which algorithm to use is a multivariate decision right it can depend on how big is the message how many peers are there what's the architecture of the network what's the architecture on the nodes there's a lot of things that it can be done and, and it's it's uh, not a fully solved problem so in open mpi 4.1 we have all those algorithms. Actually, we've had all these algorithms for a long time, but picking them is is the trick. In 4.1, we did a bit of, of tweaking of that. So we improved our algorithm selection at runtime. So at the point when you invoke MPI reduce, we do a little bit of thinking about which one should we do, and then we invoke it behind the scenes. We tweaked a bit how that works to get some nice performance improvements. And this is in preparation for OpenMPI 5 that we have these new components coming that represent a lot of years of research out of the University of Tennessee. So there's some optional collective components coming in 4.1. They're not gonna be the default, but they're gonna be there because we wanna get some real world usage for this. Because this is, this is also part of the strength of the OpenMPI community that we have researchers involved and they come up with awesome proof of concept code that we as a community then turn into, you know, harden it up and turn it into a product that can then be used by everybody. So this, these new components that are coming out of the University of Tennessee, they're pretty good, but we need to get them into the real world and find out, you know, shake out the bugs, get them nice and stable so that hopefully at OpenMPI 5, we have a whole new generation of collective operations that is stable, robust, and gives a bunch of performance improvements uh, over what's available in the 4.x series. So more details about how to use those are going to be forthcoming. I don't have that information today. Uh, potentially we'll have that uh, ready for uh, the part three. Uh, the next one is the PML. And we see a lot of questions about the PML. The PML stands for point-to-point -point messaging layer. So it's the back end of things like NPI send, NPI receive, and, and so on. There are three main PMLs that OpenMPI has. So these are really the engines behind, like even if you do a three gigabyte MPI send, the PML is the one that makes sure that it might have to chunk up the message into multiple fragments and send it across and reassemble it on the other side, whatever is necessary to get, you know, the reliable message transmission across the other side. So oh, we have three different engines for this, right? OB1 is the first one. It's our oldest one. It was among the first ones that we did in OpenMPI. And it is inherently a multi-device and multi-rail engine. And underneath OB1, it uses BTL components, otherwise known as byte transfer layer. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. We have another engine called CM. And that is for a specific type of network that are called matching networks. And I'll talk about what exactly a matching network is in a moment. But underneath CM, they don't use BTLs. CM uses MTLs for the matching transport layer. And then finally, we have a third one called UCX, and that uses the UCX communication library, stands for Unified Communications X. I think the X is meant to be a wildcard that it can talk to anything. Um, 
And that just uses the UCX communication library and they do a lot of offloading here. So let's talk about these in a little more detail here. So OB1, um, I said OB1 is a multi-device, multi-rail engine. It was one of the first ones. What will happen is that at startup and throughout the process, if you say, hey, I want to MPI send to number 17, OB1 will go look and figure out which BTL instances can go talk to rank 17 on that communicator. So it'll actually even potentially, it'll find all of them that can talk to 17. So let's say you have a, a good Cisco UCS server and you have uh, two ethernet ports out um, and they have the US NIC communication protocol on them. I have to do a little bit of plugging for my own product, apologize for that. Um, it, OB1 will say, oh, you have two devices out there. You have two US NIC VTL instances. I will stripe the message across both of them. It could be a bandwidth multiplier in that way. And that's the same thing even happens with plain vanilla TCP and other network transports that we have VTLs for. Um, it's the inherent multi-device, multi-rail kind of engine there. So uh, like I said before, OB1 was one of the original uh, transports that we had in OpenMPI. Um, and going back to the first session, uh, we are very terrible at naming things. And so, yes, Obi-Wan actually is a Star Wars reference. There are a bunch of Star Wars references throughout OpenMPI. Um, so when you look at OP1, that's why it's not named something more intuitive like multi-rail or something. I don't know. It's just called OB one because that's what it is. And we've been stuck with it for years. So sorry about that. But on the picture on the right there, you can see that's kind of semantically how it happens, right? MPI send calls OB1. OB1 found like, oh, I found three VTLs that can talk to the other side. I'll give a chunk of the message to each one of them. And uh, on the other side, the VTLs all receive their chunks. The receiving of OB1 reassembles it into a coherent message and gives it to MPI, the matching MPI receive. All right. Now, in the uh, which BTLs are available for uh, the entire 4.x series. Here's a, a list of them. Um, the ones that are common are really self, SM, uh, TCP, and US NIC. Um, I, I put some stars for the ones that are least commonly used, um, but actually some of the others are not very common as well. Portals 4 is not very well commonly used. SM CUDA is not very commonly used. I'll get to the more CUDA stuff in a few minutes. Um, and so on. You, the, the UCT one there is kind of like an alternate UCX, and the OFI is an alternate for the lib fabric. Um, same thing with Eugenie, that is an alternate path for the Eugenie um, Cray interfaces. And I'll get to the, the preferred ones in a minute. Um, here's what CM is. So I, I mentioned before that this is for matching networks, and that is for a network that was created for MPI. So in the last 10, 15 years or so, some network vendors have added natural stuff into their uh, fabric that meets the abstractions of what MPI wants. And that's what's called matching. So the concept of having a, a communicator and an MPI tag um, and then a payload and things like that, that is just built into the network itself, as opposed to something like TCP sockets or shared memory where we have to figure all that kind of stuff out ourselves. Like, oh, here's an incoming message. Let's look at the tag. Let's look at the communicator ID. But, but forget all that. In a matching network, that stuff is actually an inherent part of the interfaces for that network itself. So a bunch of networks are like that these days. Um, and so what CM is, is actually a super thin shim to talk to whatever the underlying communications library is. So that's I tried to represent it by a thin purple bar there that we talk to the underlying library via an MTL plugin. So an MTL is really just a conduit for one of these underlying uh, matching network libraries and say, oh, here's a big old message, do what you're gonna do to get it to the peer. Um, that also includes shared memory because particularly if the network itself supports matching, it has to support matching for both uh, local recipients and remote recipients. And that's not necessarily a different namespace. And so therefore the matching network fabric itself has to handle both local and remote transports. So we don't even have a separate entity for shared memory here. It is assumed that the matching network fabric handles shared memory for local recipients as well. Um, now, in this case, um, there can only be one, right? So in the, in the OB1 world, you can have a bunch of BTLs available 
and we use whichever one we split the ob1 is the engine that splits it and reassembles it and does all the things here in the cm world if you're going to do matching at the network layer you have to know who all the peers are you can't have some peers of one type and, and other peers handled by a different matching fabric library they all have to be handled in the single uh, network library itself hence there can only be one mtl and that is where the genesis of the name for this again apologies on horrible names it mean nothing outside the open mpi developer community um, cm is a reference to uh, a movie called highlander where there's a character in there called connor mcleod cm and one of the big themes of that movie is there can only be one i'm not going to say anything more about the plot of that movie if you care it's an old movie uh, but there can only be one, which is a reference to there can only be one MTL component used at runtime. Uh, in uh, the 4.x series, there are three MTLs that are used. So there's OFI, which is how most lip fabric uh, base networks are used. There's also Portals 4, which is used in some of the U.S. national labs. And then there's PSM2 for single threaded Omnipath. Um, and that is a, uh, the abbreviation for that is performance scaled messaging. The last one, the last PML is UCX. So the UCX community kind of went a different way. They said, actually, we're going to hide everything from you. Uh, we're going to have an entire engine ourselves, um, and we're going to up-level that to the PML. And so when you have a UCX PML, it itself is a multi-rail, multi-device engine, um, and it just handles whatever the transports are. So from OpenMPI's perspective, we don't have any concept of what's back there. From our perspective, we have one UCX PML talking to another UCX PML. There is a UCX library and some other transport in between there, but we don't have any visibility on that. So this diagram is a, almost a little misleading that we're not showing the actual transport libraries there, but that's what we see from the MPI perspective. And that actually is a specific design point for what the UCX uh, community was going for in this design. So with all of these, you really get to a complicated, what the, which network is used? Which network stack is used at runtime? Because um, sometimes there's ambiguity, like, all right, just about every cluster out there has TCP, um, but I might have some kind of accelerated uh, transport that I want to use as well. How can I know which one is going to get used? All right, well, let's take the TCP question out for the moment and talk more about, like, all right, assuming that OpenMPI sees my high performance networks out there, which one is going to get used? Which stack is going to get used? And here's three general rules, which kind of sums it all up. If you have InfiniBand or Rocky, where Rocky is RDMA over converged Ethernet, right? So it's a, let's say you have a, a Mellanox Ethernet card that supports Rocky or some other vendor's card that supports Ethernet Rocky, um, you're going to end up using, or by default, you will use the UCX PML because UCX PML is kind of the next generation of InfiniBand support, and Rocky is really just the InfiniBand wire protocol wrapped up in Ethernet frames. Um, so they're kind of the same thing. So you'll end up using UCX for, for both of those. If you have a matching network, like I described before, or if you have iWarp, you will end up using the CM PML and a relevant MTL. Right, and so a matching network being all the ones that we listed before, and iWarp is kind of lumped in here um, by itself, which is a little bit weird, um, but let me explain that actually. So iWarp um, made a big explosion on the HPC scene, uh, I don't know, a bunch of years ago. It has kind of fallen back a little bit. We actually had an iWarp user ask us about iWarp support recently, um, and uh, we said, yeah, you end up using the CMPML and software emulation in lib fabric but that is because the iwar vendors have kind of uh, faded away from the hpc community so there isn't an optimized path for that um, there is a, a deprecated um, optimized path called the openid btl um, but we're kind of discouraging that because the whole openid btl is going away in open mpi 5. so uh, in the interim, if you are an iWarp customer, please encourage your vendor to get involved in the MPI and HPC community if you want a better transport in your MPI layer. Um, if you don't fall into number one or number two, you fall into number three, which is use the OB1 PML and the appropriate BTLs. And again, plural here. 
as opposed to in two where you only use uh, you know one MTL. So this includes TCP for quote unquote plain Ethernet environments and also includes shared memory. Say you're even running on a laptop or something like that. Um, OB1 is going to be used and, and that's cool. Right. Uh, there's a bunch of others here too. Let's show this kind of pictorially here. So UCX is used for InfiniBand or Rocky. Um, here's CM, PML, plus a couple of different MTLs for the different transports that are available out there. So OFI, remember, is Open Fabrics Interfaces, and that's uh, the formal name for LibFabric. So use it for LibFabrics that support matching networks, in particular Amazon's EFA, Craze, Eugeni, and software emulation of iWarp networks. Um, and then OB1 PML plus BTLs is used for all the others. For example, self, which is process loopback, shared memory, TCP, my product US NIC is in there uh, as well. And there's a couple other ones. Um, oh, that kind of truncated that. There is, it says other less common BTLs. I'll make sure that is uh, corrected on the PDF that we publish afterwards. Um, here's also just a, a flashback here of UCX and LibFabric. Um, this was shown in uh, part one, showing all the networks that are supported in the two different libraries and then where they actually overlap. So they both, over, they both have shared memory and TCP support. But I grayed out the ones that we don't use LibFabric or UCX for in OpenMPI. So the dark black ones, that's what we use those particular libraries for. Um, for the other ones, like NetDirect, NetDirect is a Windows technology. OpenMPI actually doesn't even support Microsoft Windows these days. Uh, we also don't have a transport that uses raw UDP sockets. We could, uh, but there isn't much of a performance gain for it, at least in our use cases, so we don't do it. And the shared memory and TCP, uh, we don't use that stuff um, directly from UCX or LibFabric. Um, usually you'll use OB1 BTL and the appropriate BTL for that. Um, I'm sorry, OB1 PML and the appropriate BTLs uh, for that kind of stuff. So just a comparison of where these libraries are and how they kind of fit in the overall jigsaw puzzle. Now, common question is, what if I want to use a different network stack? Or I could put a different title on here. What if I want to force the use of a particular network stack, right? Okay, so let's look at the three examples here, right? So, so our three PMLs. Well, if I want to force the use of OB1 and the BTLs, I use what are called MCA parameters. And I believe we touched on these briefly in part one, and Ralph definitely mentioned them earlier in this session. MCA stands for MCA, our um, modular component architecture, and MCA parameters are how we pass in parameters to the system at runtime, giving information to the system on the user intent. Like, I want to use the PM, the OB1 PML. Well, we have an MCA parameter called PML, and its value is which PML you want to use. So you can say dash dash MCA PML OB1. Then you can also specify the BTL MCA parameter, and you can provide a comma delimited list saying, these are the ones that you are allowed to use OpenMPI. So you can say TCP comma SM comma self. And then OpenMPI will restrict itself and only use the OB1 PML and only use the TCP, SM, and self BTLs. Nothing else will be considered at all. So if you have a different network and a different network stack and OpenMPI has support for that, OB1 won't, I'm sorry, uh, OpenMPI won't even open up those components at all. It'll only open up the OB1 component and the TCP, self, and SM BTL components. Similarly, so with that big long-winded explanation, it also applies to uh, CM, right? So I could just say, oh, use dash dash MCA PML CM and then dash dash MCA MTL and list the one MTL that you want to use. So this can, you know, using either one of these will force OpenMPI to use that specific set of network stacks that you want, either a bunch of BTLs and OB1 or a single MTL and CM. And in this way, you can you know, guarantee which network OpenMPI is using. Um, this is helpful in a troubleshooting sense. For example, if you're seeing lower performance than you expect, uh, if you don't specify these, uh, you know, the PML and BTL or MTL parameters, it could be because something is wrong with your network stack. OpenMPI didn't choose it and just fell back to TCP, right? And so you might be getting lower performance than you expect because you're not using the network stack that you expect. And so a typical um, 
troubleshooting thing is like, oh, okay, well, let's force the use of CM and force the use of the OFI MTL because I have a matching network and I know I should be using that. And if that errors out because no matching network is available, well, that's a telling clue to you. You're like, oh, well, I should have a matching network available. Why did OpenMPI fail to use it? Right? And then you can go into more troubleshooting from there about like what's wrong with my matching network or did I not build OpenMPI with matching level support, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then finally, the last one, uh, there are no sub parameters, at least in OpenMPI uh, for the UCX. You just say, hey, I want to use the PML UCX. And again, that one's for InfiniBand and Rocky. Now, it is harmless but useless to specify DTLs with CM or MTLs with OB1. You can do it. We're not even going to complain about it. You won't get any warning message or anything. Just those will effectively end up being ignored because you're like, well, I'm using CM, so I'm not even really going to look at the BTLs that you told me to use because I'm not using BTLs with CM. And similarly with MTLs and OB1. But we get this question a bunch, so figured I'd throw it on the slide here. All right, let's talk about CUDA. Uh, CUDA is a popular source of questions these days. So the UCX and PSM2 supports GPU Direct RDMA. Remember, there are multiple flavors of GPU Direct. GPU Direct RDMA is the one that HPC tends to care about. Um, there are fine distinctions. I'm not, I'm not going to go into the difference between them, but GPU Direct RDMA is typically the ones that you want. Um, there are a whole bunch of tunable options and parameters that are technically outside the scope of OpenMPI. We expose those, um, but they're really underlying options of UCX and or PSM2 and or CUDA. We're just providing a mechanism for you to get through them to OpenMPI. So I'm not going to go into too many details about them. I will just tell you in an upcoming slide here about how you can see those. Um, now, a common question that we get is, hey, can I put CUDA code in my MPI application? Um, and my answer is yes, but with care. It is complicated. It is kind of tricky to get right. Um, we really only advise this for, for experts. So I say it is not for the meek. Um, it is possible, yes. Uh, we do have an FAQ section about this on the OpenMPI website, and there are some very detailed instructions there. So go have a look at that if you want more details on that. Um, further on CUDA, we got this section, this question in the last session, and I didn't have a good answer, so I have a more complete answer uh, now. Can I run a CUDA built OpenMPI on a node that has no GPUs? And I'm actually going to clarify that question to be on a node with no CUDA libraries, because those are technically two different questions. Um, so let's get to that. In general, it is certainly easiest if you have the CUDA libraries installed across all your the nodes in your cluster. Say, for example, you have 100 nodes and only 10 of them have GPUs because GPUs are expensive. It is certainly easier if you have the CUDA libraries installed on all 100 nodes. But some people don't like to do that. Some people like to say, well, I only want to have the CUDA libraries on the 10 nodes where I have GPUs, right? Um, you can do that. You may very well need two different OpenMPI installs, or more specifically, two different UCX installs. Right, because UCX and PSM2 are the things that link against CUDA. Um, and so you may need to have different installations of, uh, to match the fact that you have CUDA on some machines and no CUDA on other machines. And that's why I say it's just easier if you have the CUDA libraries installed everywhere. We can actually, and UCX will detect like, oh, I have the CUDA libraries, but I have no CUDA devices, I have no GPUs. That can be handled gracefully at runtime. But if you don't have the CUDA libraries installed and UCX is expecting to find the CUDA libraries, you'll actually get the UCX PML fail to load because of a linker error, right? So that's what the no means in the last big bullet there is that um, if UCX was compiled with CUDA support and you don't have the CUDA libraries installed on that node, the UCX PML will fail to load because of a linker error. Right. Um, that being said, again, just put the, the CUDA libraries everywhere if you can, and UCX and PSM should, uh, PSM2 should just gracefully handle like, well, I don't see any GPUs present, so I'll just ignore that CUDA functionality, but it's still a runtime linker dependency that has to be there. So this gets into the deeper question of how do we interface to external libraries? Again, I mentioned a couple slides ago the uh, parameterized system that we've got, the modular component architecture parameters. 
because what a, a lot of OpenMPI does is we're just the glue to talk to these external libraries like Libfabrics and UCX and CUDA and others. Um, we don't necessarily control all the knobs of those external libraries. And so we don't even try. Sometimes we just pass through the parameters. Um, and a lot of these, we have uh, you know, corresponding NCA parameters that you can use to get to these knobs for Libfabric uh, and, and others. Um, but UCX, for example, they chose to go a different direction. Um, they don't use our MCA parameter system to pass parameters. They just use UCX specific environment variables. And so you need to refer to their documentation to find out what all of those are. Um, now, that being said, if you are going to set MCA parameters, you can set them in one of three ways. You can set them on the command line. So MPI run dash dash MCA key and value, right? So in this case, foo is the key and bar is the value. Um, and then Baz is another key and Yao is another one. So you can list dash dash MCA multiple times on a command line and we'll use those all as unique individual key equals value pairs. Um, don't list the same key multiple times. Don't say MCA foo A and then MCA foo B. It can be confusing as to which one will actually be used. Don't do it, just don't do it. <laughs> um, yeah, just don't do it. Um, uh, have unique keys and values on the command line there. You can also use environment variables if that floats your boat. You don't want to have a long, crazy uh, command line. You can export umpi MCA and then the name of the key equals the value. Um, those will get automatically slurped up by MPI run and uh, the other runtime machinations as Ralph talked about earlier. You can also have text config files. This is really helpful for having site-wide defaults. And it's an INI style key equals IE text file. This is the fault location where that file is. So in prefix, etc, open MPI, MCA, prams .com. There's a truckload of comments in there that explain how it works. But this is really great if you have users who don't know or care how your open MPI works, but you want to set a PML and a set of BTLs and make sure that everybody uses those. We can put it in this site-wide file and people will, you know, your users who don't know or care will just do MPI run a dot out and it'll pick up the defaults that you've set in that site-wide file. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in, in part three because it gets a little more complicated in Open MPI 5, but that's for a future date. Um, also, the umpi info command, I mentioned this in part one, but it can show you all kinds of things about your Open MPI installation, um, but it can also show you about what MCA parameters are available. So you can do umpi info dash dash all and optionally dash dash parsable, which will put it in a machine parsable output as opposed to a pretty print format. And this will show you all of the parameters that are available. These parameters are exactly what's available in the MPIT programmatic interface as well. So the MPIT APIs can be used to read and uh, write to these values in your application as well. So go look in the uh, MPI specification for the MPIT APIs we expose all of our MCA parameters through the MPIT API interface. Now, MPIT has this concept of level, and there are nine levels. And so we have taken those nine levels and also associated them with our MCA parameters as well. So there are basically three sets of three. The first three are the end user, the next four are application tuner, and the last three, I'm sorry, the first three, the next three, and the last three are the MPI developer. So they're, they're meant to be increasing level of complexity, that level one is the, the simplest stuff and level nine is the most advanced stuff. So if nothing else, you don't have to remember the three groups of three. Level one is the simplest stuff, level nine is the most complex stuff. We typically put stuff in level nine if we don't expect users to use them at all. Um, we put stuff in levels one to three is the relatively simple stuff and four, five, six, we put things in there for uh, more advanced users, people who are really trying to tweak the system. But that's the general scope of uh, what we got there. And with that, I am at the end. And I think we've still got a couple of minutes for questions. So, Kenneth, I don't know how many came in. Yeah, we have several questions, and I think we can take the time to answer them. Um, the first one is, does OB1 know about speeds of multiple channels? So, for example, InfiniBand versus Internet. Does it, so it doesn't put chunks on both slow and fast wires slowing down uh, the speed of the slowest wire? Good question. And I'm going to, uh, there's multiple parts to this question. Um, we do have a ranking system of BTLs, um, so to speak. So 
it's not always possible. Actually, with modern Linux kernels, it is possible. But back when we wrote uh, uh, OB1 and the TCP DTL, it wasn't really possible to get the line speed of Ethernet on there. Uh, but even if you have, say, 100 gig Ethernet, you may not want to use raw TCP sockets because the latency sucks, right? You might still want to use, uh, say, USNIC or OB1 for Rocky or you know some other Ethernet transport that has much better latency characteristics. Um, even if the bandwidth characteristics are going to end up being roughly the same. Um, so we basically have TCP as one of our lowest priority VTLs. It's generally the fallback if nothing else is selected. Um, there's a complicated mechanism inside OpenMPI to ensure that that happens, but generally that's what, what happens there. So if you have a US NIC uh, thing or a Rocky thing, almost certainly a different VTL will be, if you're forcing OB1 there, because uh, Rocky will default to UCX, by the way, but US NIC, for example, is an Ethernet one, and we do OB1, that will naturally get selected uh, over TCP sockets. You say it will default to UCX, but, uh, but only if UCX is there. Because uh, correct. Yes, I'm sorry, that's an excellent point, um, that you had to have compiled your OpenMPI with the UCX library, so if the UCX PML is available, then it will default to do that. Um, Otherwise, it will default to the OpenID BTL in the OpenMPI 4.x series, but the OpenID BTL is going away in the OpenMPI 5.x series. Um, and so if you don't build with UCX, then you will not get Rocky support or InfiniBand support. So please start using UCX now. That is what the vendors want you to use. Okay, next question. Um, is there any performance benefit to forcing a particular PML over just letting OpenMPI figure one out? Usually, we will pick the right thing. Um, we took a lot of pains to, you know, these internal ranking mechanisms and probing the system at runtime to figure out which to do. Usually, OpenMPI will just do the right thing. Um, and usually, that's easy because you typically have Ethernet and one other network that you paid extra money for because you needed an HPC class network type of thing. So usually we're like, oh, we see the standard TCP and we see some other thing. Oh, I should probably use the other thing. And that makes it easy, right? Um, sometimes that doesn't happen though. Sometimes you're in a heterogeneous environment. Sometimes complicated stuff arises. That's why we gave the MCA system, the command line parameters. If you need something more complicated, you can do it. Um, and usually that is uh, for one of two reasons. One, you just have some more complicated thing, like maybe you have two different networks and you want to force using one of them um, or force using the other one. Um, or for whatever reason, OpenMPI just made the wrong choice. Um, the code that we have in there, like I said, it usually chooses the right thing, but sometimes sometimes it doesn't, right? We're, we're writing code that has to run in basically an infinite number of environments and they're all just slightly different. So sometimes we choose the wrong thing. So sometimes you need to specify it on the command line or an environment variable or a config file. I, I think the question is also partially what type of overhead there is for OpenAPI checking at runtime. Because if you tell it what to do, it won't have to check. Ah, good question. Uh, the overhead is just during MPI init, we basically make these you know, decisions at the very beginning of the application. So it's not like the decision is made at every MPI send and MPI receive and things like that. The decision is really made at the beginning of time. It's a fairly negligible overhead. Okay. Good question. Um, one more question. Any particular reason to do TCP shared memory with the BTLs instead of UCX? So is there a performance reason or is it just because you had to pick one and it doesn't really matter? Oh, uh, like using the TCP and UCX versus the TCP BTL with OB1. Um, at the time, I okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna disclaim my my comments here. With I am not part of the UCX community, so I'm gonna make a, a supposition here. But I am part of the Lib Fabric community, so uh, I can say what our experience was in the Lib Fabric community. So, for example, you could use TCP with Lib Fabric and the OFI MTL over CM, right? Um, the performance is not as great as you would think it is because you're adding a couple layers of software abstraction in there because we're emulating a matching network over TCP. TCP is not naturally a matching layer. So we have software emulation of, of um, uh, the, the MPI style matching stuff. Um, so it adds overhead to do TCP in Libfabric. 
whereas the TCP BTL in OpenMPI is native, is customized, is exactly what we need and nothing more in OpenMPI. So it's a bit more optimized for our use case. So when we want to do pure TCP, we prefer OB1 and uh, the TCP BTL because we know that that is fairly well tuned uh, for our environment. So that's how it is in LibFabric. I suspect that a similar case would be true on the UCX side as well. Oh, I should also say that on the LibFabric side, LibFabric, one of the primary design constraints is to support these high-speed HPC class networks. Um, so at least in LibFabric's early life, there wasn't a lot of emphasis on TCP performance because TCP was meant to be like, oh, I want to develop on uh, my laptop uh, so I can write my application on my laptop and then go over to the big iron and run with the same exact application, but just use a different transport under LibFabric. So the TCP performance has to be correct and it has to work, but we don't have to squeak every possible cycle and um, you know, drive down that latency to be as low as possible. Uh, later, there was actually quite a bit of emphasis put on uh, you know, getting good TCP performance uh, out of LibFabric. Um, but still, you know, the one that we have in OpenMPI, the TCP BTL, is a bit more performant for our particular use case. Uh, I don't know where, you know, how the UCX community views their TCP component, whether they've tried to, you know, drive performance out of it, or is it a similar situation? You know, I just want to have TCP so I can develop on my laptop and then go to the big iron and run my same UCX application uh, without having to recompile or change my code. Yeah. Okay. I think that's clear. Um, there was another question which, which maybe already got answered, um, but I'll ask it anyway. How would one get the equivalent of using dash dash MCA PM UCX? So specifying the UCX uh, PML, I guess, um, when running when using MPI run, when you're using SRUN instead. So do you just set the environment variable to specify that UCX should be used, or is there another way? Yeah, Ralph, I'm going to pull you in on this one, too. I think the right answer is you should put it in the config file. Um, Ralph, what do we do for environment variable forwarding in Ra direct launch? Ra Ralph, Ralph left already, so he had another meeting. Oh, super sad. Um, okay. I, I, oh, man, I know there's a question about do we, okay, because when you're doing direct launch, uh, and direct launch is when you use like S run or something like that. You're not using MPI run. You're using the resource manager's launcher. There is differences in the characteristics of how things run. We are playing in their sandbox at that point. As opposed to MPI run, we control everything about that. We do process binding for you. We do environment variable forwarding for you. We do standard in and out forwarding for you and things like that. But when you're using something like S run, we're playing in their sandbox and it's their defaults of what happens. So for example, S run does not bind for you by default. And this was a matter of contention for a while. Um, so, like, you can actually get lower performance if you do S run, don't specify a binding, and do your MPI thing. So, uh, because MPI run, we will bind by default. S run and potentially others. I'm I'm not an expert in these things. Um, don't bind by default. So there's a noticeable performance difference depending on how you launch and what options you specify to S run. So, all this coming back to say, I don't remember offhand if S run will automatically forward uh, environment variables for us. I think they don't, but I'm not going to swear to that. Um, no. So that being said, it is safe to just put it in the config file because the config file doesn't have to be forwarded. It's just going to be, you know, available on your network file system and we can open that up on your MPI run on your MPI nodes and see that stuff. All right. Long answer. All these things end up being unexpectedly complicated, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have one more question. Um, using CUDA aware MPI basically allows the developer to pass device, device buffers to MPI API. If such programs are compiled with an open MPI compiled without CUDA support, is there any fallback to non-RDMA communication? Can you repeat that question? So say open MPI is compiled without CUDA support, um, mm -hmm. Is there a fallback to non-RDMA communication when you're using CUDA aware MPI in the application? Oh, okay. So it, this gets to be very overloaded marketing terms. Um, so let's say you're using UCX 
uh, and UCX was not compiled with CUDA support, um, but you're using InfiniBand, okay? Um, in this case, what will happen is uh, when you MPI send and receive, let's see, if you try to MPI send and receive from uh, DPU device memory, I think it's just gonna fail um, if you don't have CUDA support inside uh, UCX because the memory mapping is just gonna get wrong. Um, so I think that will just flat out fail. But if you're running a CUDA application and you copy things back up into main memory yourself, and then do MPI send and receive, then we'll just do normal RDMA types of things across you know, your UCX, your InfiniBand network. So the, the, the reason I mentioned the, the overloading of marketing terms is beware of the difference of RDMA versus GPU direct RDMA, right? RDMA is InfiniBand style uh, communication offload, right? So directly sending from memory, right? Um, you know, through the network card without going through the operating system, uh, specifying the source and target address, all that kind of stuff. That's RDMA. GPU direct RDMA is sending and receiving from GPU device memory, regardless of whether that's actually RDMA or old style send and receive. So that's it's a bit confusing of a term, but that's actually what it means. GPU direct RDMA means sending from device memory, no matter what the actual underlying transport is, even if it's not RDMA. Did I answer the question? <laughs> I think so, because we're getting a response from okay. who raised it, um, that the question is answered, so that's good. Um, one more question, and I have a related one. So um, is there an easy way to know which network BTL has been selected? And, and my related question is, is there a way to query what OpenMPI sees in terms of available um, BTLs or? Ah, good one. So this has been a perennial ask for forever. Like, hey, can you just show me which networks you're using? Um, turns out it's a surprisingly difficult thing because that question is a distributed question. It is a per process decision about what it is. Almost always they make the same decisions, but the real problem is like, all right, let's say I'm running on 100 nodes and node 77 has its HPC class network is down. And so we fall back to TCP on that one. So everybody made the same decision uh, everywhere, except for when they're talking to number 77 and 77, uh, his decision out to everyone. So noting the exception is what actually became difficult because we basically have to do a global gather of everybody's communication endpoints to figure that out. And that particularly when running at scale is not scalable. Um, Fairly recently, um, IBM contributed a patch upstream to us in the OpenMPI community, OpenMPI version, um, as opposed to their Spectrum MPI, internal one. Um, a, uh, oh, what's it called? I forget the exact thing. It's coming in OpenMPI 5 that you can basically say, uh, put a thing on the command line and we'll uh, uh, output an abbreviated graph of uh, what the connectivity was. Um, and there's a couple disclaimers with that. It's kind of complicated. Let's take a note, Kenneth, to make sure to mention that one in, in, in part three. Um, the second half of the question of, can you programmatically query OpenMPI for that information? Um, that is a no right now. So right now, the only thing we're gonna have in OpenMPI, or at least what's planned for OpenMPI 5, is this command line parameter that will emit something on standard out. Um, having an API for that, if that is something that people are interested in having, we can talk about that. Because if we, well, I don't know, that gets kind of tricky because the information goes back to MPI run. It doesn't really go back to an MPI process. Yeah, but that, that's my, tricky. My, um, my question was actually getting it just on the command line as an output. So you're saying that's not available yet, but it's planned. Oh, okay. Yes, on the command line, it's coming in OpenMPI 5. Right now, what we tell people is, uh, if you need to know which one it is, your best bet is to specify the PML and either the MTL or the BTLs or whatever it is, specify that out on the command line and see if you're getting a performance difference compared to when you don't specify it. Um, so kind of uh, discover by inference rather than being able to show a specific listing. There, there is some debugging output you can do, but it's fairly messy. Um, you can, do, you can set some MCA parameters which turn on verbosity in OB1 or CM. It gets pretty hard to read because you get just a truckload of output 
and you have to decipher it like, oh, Obi-Wan finally decided like he can't use U.S. Nick, but that's, you know, buried deep within 300 lines of output kind of stuff. Okay. Um, there's a question popping up that we may be answering in part three, but I'll raise it anyway. Are there any more advantages or disadvantages of using S run versus MPI run? So direct launch versus MPI run. Because it's a pretty common question that um, we're, about what we should advise to our users. Yeah, again, I wish Ralph was here to answer this one. I think the biggest win is um, people who don't want to learn MPI run. Um, that's not true. There are pros and cons on both sides. Um, let's talk about the pros of using, say, S run directly. If your users and or customers are just used to S run because they launch non-MPI things, great. Don't have them learn MPI run. They can launch their MPI processes through S run. Perhaps they're already familiar with all the command line environments and options that S-Run already has. You can just keep them in that ecosystem and they don't have to learn something new. Like, what is this MPI run thing? Why is it different than a Great, just use S-Run, right? Um, and so it's really, if you like that ecosystem, keep doing that. There used to be a scalability reason for that as well, that direct launch was more scalable. Um, I don't believe that that is true. With all the advancements of PMIX, and modern integration. So if you have recent versions of OpenMPI, recent versions of Slurm, I think your scalability is gonna be pretty much the same whether you use direct launch or whether you use MPI run because underneath they're using the same mechanism, right? Um, so I, I think that is not so much a factor. We should get confirmation from Ralph on that. So please take that as Jeff thinks that's true and we'll find out and we'll talk about that in part three. Um, the pros of using MPI run is that ours is more tailored towards MPI, right? And open MPI in particular. So we do things like bind by default. We do things like providing a bunch of, uh, you know, access to the MCA parameter system. We do things like having things that are relevant to the whole MPI ecosystem thing. So it's, it's a more specific launcher for what you're trying to do. Whereas S run is a generalized launcher and can launch a million different things. And so therefore it's not super customized to MPI specific things. So it's really not that one is worse than the other, it's which one do you wanna play in? Um, and you accept the pros and cons of, of that environment. Okay, good. I think that's all we have for questions. There was one that maybe um, popped up, so you covered um, the question about OB1 versus UCX for TCP. Is it the same argument for the shared memory as well? So why OpenMPI prefers OB1 yes. rather than UCX for shared memory? Uh, very much so. Um, our shared memory, we have spent a ton of time optimizing the hell out of our shared memory. Um, so I would definitely use, uh, in, in OpenMPI 4.x, it's called Vader. In 5.x, we're finally renaming. Oh, I need to go back and make sure my slides say the right thing about 4.x. And um, this is a, a, another terrible Star Wars name. Shared memory, BTL, and uh, all the way up through OpenMPI 4.x is called Vader. Um, terrible name. I apologize. In 5.x, we're finally renaming it back to SM, which is a little more intuitive for shared memory. But the alias Vader will still be there. So if you have scripts and things like that that use, uh, you know, MCA, BTL, blah, 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 Vader, that will still work. It'll just be a, an alias for the SM one. But in 4.x, it's Vader. Um, that thing has been tuned uh, and optimized crazy hard for the MPI use case. It does things like single copy. Uh, if you have KNM or some of the other, or CMA or some of the other single copy mechanisms that are available in Linux these days uh, as well. And I believe that they are generally ahead of the shared memory performance in both libfabric and UCX. Okay, good. I think we have all questions covered. So thank you very much. Also to Ralph. I'll throw one disclaimer on there. Um, sure. Feel free to, to test that out and make sure I'm not lying to you. Um, you know, test the shared memory of open fabrics, test the shared memory of UCX. If we don't beat them, uh, we need to fix that because <laughs> we should be more customized for this environment. But you know, if you got a problem, let us know. Let's uh, let's fix it. Okay, good. Yeah, we have everything covered, so I think we're good to wrap up. We're a little bit over time, but um, 
I think we have all questions answered. So there will be part three indeed um, on August 5th, so about four weeks from now. And thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us and raising all the questions. Oh, man. I apologize. I'm going to go back to the previous one. I forgot to update the last slide. Sorry. This is the right date. It's August 5th. Ignore what was just there on the last slide. <laughs> yeah. August 5th is part three of the session. Part three. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you, everybody.